Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love, your loving kindness and your strength that sustain us through every situation, every challenges we face in our lives. Father, now we are really at the start of the season. Put in us a fervor for your kingdom and a yearning longing to pray for all these youngsters. I pray you open their hearts. Sometimes it's not easy to understand your words, but when the Holy Spirit work, Lord, let us see beyond our flesh, our problems, and to see how you work in us and through us. And thank you so much. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, come. I have a very straightforward message for you today. Okay, um, the strength to place your treasure rightly. And I think one of the most difficult lessons I face as a believer uh, is to restore the right values in my heart okay uh, throughout my Christian life now I realize I can do a lot of things without having the right value in me I can come to church I can serve in church now I can be an advocate of uh, say remnant ministry and serve in every aspect of the church but I can be doing all these things without having the right values in me I'm talking about the right values so what I'm going to talk about now, what you are doing in church, everything, singing to the Lord, you know, praising Him, doing everything to bring the gospel out, it all boils down to what you truly treasure in the end. You can understand what I'm saying? What you truly treasure in the end, now, is where the strength comes from. So what do you treasure? It is, all, is it all about listening to God, getting the praises from Him and living for the Kingdom? Or are you approaching Christianity uh, as a form of, say, achievement? Or some people are serving it as a task? Or some people I, I've seen before, they are living Christian life with a good attitude. They just want to be a good attitude Christian. Christian with good attitude, okay? Is this all about that? Now, this is the question we've got to ask ourselves. What prompts you to do what you are doing now, everyone? Now, take a minute to think about this. What prompts you to come every Thursday night? And some of you have homework not finished. <laughs> My kids came. <laughs> they, have, they have tons of homework not finished. What prompts you to, to come to church every week and, and relentlessly, sometimes inviting your friends you know, or family members to church, and even when they are really stubborn, you know, uh, they're not there yet. But you're doing this constantly, you know, giving your tithes to the church. And for me, like spending three or four months away from my family, my wife, you know, and helping people that I barely know. Now, you think about all these things we are doing. What prompts you to do what you are doing now? And especially even sometimes when you're tired out, you're weak, you don't get praises from your pastors, you don't get appreciation from your brethren. Now, or you don't see tangible results even when you are doing a lot of these things, you know. But what prompts you to do it? Now, I get the answer is, it's the treasure in my heart that spurs me on. Now, listen. The treasure in your heart is where you find all the strength. Okay? Amen? Now, um, I, now take for instance, okay, um, uh, I remember when my, my wife just first gave birth to my firstborn, Mary. <laughs> so, I, I remember very clearly, there is an amazing strength in her. She can overcome all her tiredness, 
um, wherever she can go sleepless nights now she's taking care of her and for me when I go to work I remember when I had my firstborn uh, I mean I go to work you know every morning there's this anticipation you know morning you know I go for my breakfast and then go to work then lunchtime and then 6 p.m. again in my car I'm driving off to see my kid my child my only one then you know so the anticipation gives me all the strength to overcome the stress I face you know in my work everything and now I don't know probably John and Rachel will be experiencing this very very soon okay but I tell you that is this treasure she you know why because Mary then was all in my heart my treasure She's so real, so full. You no, know, when I do everything, you know, I think about her in the background, everything, you know, I'm just going home and see her. Give me all the strength. <laughs> now, that is the word you expected. <laughs> now, but you will see this in the spiritual aspect too. Okay, you will have to see it. People, listen up. You will have to see it. You have to understand it. Now, you cannot approach Christianity as a task because a task is dead. Once you do, you get on doing a task, you know, and then what after that? And what after that? Even if I do so well, or I didn't do so well, what after that? If you go on doing it as, uh, approach Christianity as an achievement, um, I'm serving well, I'm saving a lot of souls, you know, I feel so satisfied, it's an achievement. Now, that is motivational. That's still motivational. It's not Holy Spirit, okay, you get what I mean? It's not purely the Holy Spirit. It's still an achievement. Now, you cannot approach this as an achievement. Now, you cannot just, oh, I want to be, have a good attitude. Mm, Christian with a good attitude. No, it's not that. What comes in the task, achievement, attitude is still exhaustive. You still get tired out someday. Or when you don't see results, you will get tired out. But what is non-exhaustive, you never get tired out, is when you really have the value in your heart. This is everything. You go all out to pursue everything in it because that's the greatest value in your heart. Now, I give you an example. I give you an example. You have to get this right, okay? Now, I know last week my wife has been bugging her parents uh, to come to church. You know, last week was Good Friday and Easter Sunday, you know. Um, I saw her doing it, you know, calling them. You know, she, she was so persistent you know, calling them. But first of all, you know why it was so difficult for her? She faces so many obstacles and limitations. Now, first of all, her parents are not in the least interested to come to church. Okay? Even though so many miracles have been done you know, upon my father-in-law. You know, so, first of all, they are not in the least interested. And then, they are always sh shunning away from church. And then my wife, my children, kids are having exams, okay? And what else? And a lot of times, uh, I don't know if you noticed that, <laughs> um, my, my father-in-law always play out on, on her daughter. She said, oh, come, next day. <laughs> they never turn up. Where are you? Oh, I went somewhere else. It had happened so many times. But my wife is so persistent. I tell you, my wife, She's a weak willed person. Sometimes she's tired, lazy, and I rely on the bed in the morning, you know. Then my, my younger son will keep bugging at mom, get up, mom, you know, I'm hungry for breakfast, you know. And, you know ah, later, later, give me half an hour, and then give me five more minutes, uh, give me ten more minutes. She's like that. She, she doesn't have strong will like me. <laughs> so she always say, wow, you are amazing, you have strong will. I know, she doesn't have strong will. But this thing, for that, bugging the parents to come to church, she is very persistent. She call in the afternoon, and then call at night. And at night, and she talk for an hour. They say, what are you all waiting for? This is the best chance to hear about the gospel again, about God, about what of God. You know, come. <laughs> and then the next morning, I, I woke up early. Then I heard, she woke up, and then called the parents. And, uh, Hey, remember, today, 10.30. And then what happened? Only the mother came. <laughs> the father played her out again. You know? so, you, so you all remember that? The mother only came for the Good Friday. And my father-in-law didn't turn up for Friday, Sunday, though he had promised. He said, okay, okay, la, okay, but never come. Okay. But my wife is still persistent. Then, then after that, 
What happened was, what happened was, okay, I must think of another way. <laughs> now, she never gave up. Now I must think of another way. Now, you see, what happened is, I was beside looking at her. For a person, now, for a person who really knows what is the treasure, you, you understand what I'm trying to say? When she has understood heaven and hell, and she puts all her value there in heaven, there is no time for her to get disappointed, uh, self-defeat, uh, this man feeling lousy or helpless. No. You get what I mean? You get what I'm trying to say? All these things of feeling self-defeat, self-pity, helpless, you are all looking at yourself only. It's not having that value in you that this is everything. So if God doesn't answer now, or if my parents doesn't respond now, I'm going to do it more so, more persistent. I'm going to find out what hinders them from coming to the gospel. And sometimes, yes, I would say she get disappointed for a while. Yes, sometimes she will ask, hey, why am, of all the co-workers, their parents have turned to the Lord, most of them. But for my wife, she's a pastor wife, but the, the parents nowhere inside in church. You, you saw that? You saw that? Yeah, sometimes she get a bit of disappointment. Or sometimes she get a bit of anger. Yes, anger, because the, the dad play her out. But, but because of that value in her, that anger became a holy anger. <laughs> you, know, you know a holy anger? So, the, yeah, I'll tell you another one. When I was in China, she brought the kids to a parents' place. That's what she told me. And then she started talking to, to her mom about coming to church again and all. Now the mom said, I asked the siblings to go, you know, not me, you know. I said, why? And then the dad came and, and talked to the dad, you know. Now you come to church. And then the dad just keep quiet, you know. Ah, no need lah. I say, I, I already know this Jesus can. I have him in my heart can, you know. No, um, that kind of thing, you know. Um, just want to entertain her. Then my wife got angry. Then my wife suddenly <laughs> she got angry and said, why are you so forgetful? Don't you remember you have a heart attack in this hospital and then he saved you and then now you're turning away from him, you know. Why are you so quick to forget it? <laughs> so then the dad said, I, uh, I didn't forget lah. Uh, then I didn't forget then to come to Good Friday. Then he kept quiet. <laughs> so, but the thing is, what I'm trying to say is, if you get the right values in you, you really know what is the reality. What is the reality? The reality of heaven and hell. This is not a doctrine anymore. That is truly, truly the reality in your heart. And it plays your value in heaven. You will not dwell in your failures and disheartenment, you know. Even when you are angry, that will give you a message to spur you on and tell people about God. So what happened to remnants? Listen up. What happened to Christians nowadays is they need motivation. Now, I motivate me. I want to be motivated. I want to see what I'm doing is reaping fruits. What I'm doing produce good outcomes, positive outcomes. Now, I pray that I see the physical answer that I want. Now, I tell you, listen up, remnants. That is not, that is not the real value. If you are looking for that, if you know you have, a, you have a child, you have a child, you will do all things to take care of him. You don't need motivation. You get know what I mean? So it's about knowing the truth and having, because of you know the truth, you, you had your treasure at the right place, right in your spirit, right in your heart, and then you know you will relentlessly follow that value in making choices and decisions. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? So, now, let's turn to the Word of God and see what the Lord means by treasure. Can we turn to Luke? Let's see Luke chapter 12. Let's see what the Lord said about this so-called value that He wants to put in you. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Mm. It's a very popular verse, okay? Very popular verse. You have read it, okay? Chapter 12, verse 22, the words of Jesus, okay? Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, 
Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Now, everything, eat and wear, everything physical, everything that can be seen and enjoyed by the flesh, everything. Now, don't worry about all these things. Life, the soul, meaning, is more than food. And the body more than clothes. Mm. You notice that? Now, get your priority right, or even get the reality right. What God is saying, get the reality. Which one is more important? Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who are you? People. What is God talking about? You, children of God. Okay? You, children of God. Because at the end, you will see. Before you even ask, your Father in heaven knows what you need. Okay? So, are you more valuable than birds? In verse 25, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Now, listen up. Who of you by worrying? What do you mean by worrying? Listen. When you worry, you put your focus there. You put your hopes there. Now, everything there. You put your stakes there. No, everything. If only this thing will go well. Now, so you focus on that. But by worrying what you can do, can you do anything? So what did God say? Verse 25, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? A simple thing. Now, can you add a second to your life? So 26, God made a conclusion. Jesus made a conclusion. Since you cannot do this very little thing, this very little, you can't even do it. Why do you worry about the rest? You know, when you worry, you are not activating your spirit to pray. When you worry, you are only activating your flesh. You are strengthening your flesh. So your flesh takes charge. And, and you add on, add on more anxiety into your lives, more disbelief into your lives, you see? More doubts, everything. So verse 27, consider how the lilies grow. Beautiful lilies. They do not labor or spin. They do nothing. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of this. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow, so shortly is thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith, okay? You without any assurance, that's why you're worrying, okay? And verse 29, and do not set your heart. Now underline, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Now, what do you mean by set your heart? What do you mean by set your heart? Now think, deeper, what do you mean? Meaning, Setting your heart, meaning put your values there. Now, listen, when you put your value, you set your heart, you keep thinking about because your value is there. You understand? Your treasure is there. You know, our hopes is there. Okay. Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world, the unbelievers, people without God, runs after all such things. And your father, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom. We're going to talk about seeking his kingdom later. Seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Given to you as well. Now listen, verse 20, 32. Do not be afraid, little flock. Do not be afraid. Okay? Do not worry. Do not be anxious. Do not focus on the problem. Do not be afraid. It can mean all these things. Little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. The kingdom where you reign as king with him and gather his people. The Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. And in the kingdom is everything you need now. The Father is pleased to give you and has given you through Christ. Amen? Okay? Say amen. <laughs> and this, verse 23, And sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Now, all these things you have heard, okay? Sell your possession, provide purses. Now, I believe it's not just talking about money, okay? It is talking about what treasure. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what is your treasure, people? What is your treasure? Of course, if you read it in context, God is talking about money, where everyone plays their values there. It could be friendship for you. It could be our future for you, okay? It could be anything that you value now. 
and there your treasure, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Okay, now the message I'm going to bring across to you today is how to really treasure the right thing. Now the how thing I'm talking about now, because everyone knows they shouldn't love money. Everyone knows they should love God. Everyone knows they should love souls, place the values on man's life instead of the material things, the tangible things. No. But the question is, how? Oh, it's so hard. And we have come a long way to realize we cannot do this by our willpower. Don't you realize? <laughs> we cannot do this by just a resolution or just make a decision. Some pastors say, you make a decision today. You want to give how much, how much to the Lord? Make a decision that you want to serve the <laughs> and all these things. Make a decision. How to make a decision? I can make many decisions. I have been making many decisions in my life. Then after that, the next day, I go to work. I see, wow, the society is so competitive that I worry about my future. You know, I, I get so busy that I grumble against my colleagues, you know. A lot of things. Um, then, then I sort out my lack and then I cannot. I just made a decision yesterday or last week. But I cannot overcome it. <laughs> so... This, this shows that how powerful the flesh is. You cannot make a decision to love the Lord. You get what I'm trying to say? You cannot. No. But you can only love the Lord. You can only place your value on the right thing by knowing the truth. Now, for a start first, you have to start from knowing the truth. What you know as the truth goes inside your spirit. I say it again. What you know as the truth goes inside your spirit. It is only the spirit that can win over the flesh. So there are few vital truths in this scripture verses that we just read. Okay, we've got to go to this truth first. Because what you know as the truth now, Okay, if you think money is everything, if this is the truth, you will go all out to pursue money, but you perish in the end because of money. You understand? But now, what you know as the truth, the Holy Spirit comes from God's truth. So, what you know as the truth now, first from the scripture, you know, God is saying the first truth is simple God is simply saying, You are basically totally helpless you are totally powerless now this is the truth you got to start from here why do you think that verse start from jesus saying why do you worry about your life can you do anything about it at all you know can you do anything about it why worry about what to eat what to drink what to wear can you do anything about it can you add a single hour to your life you know so you are basically totally helpless and powerless that's the truth <laughs> Simple truth. Say, for instance, you can eat healthily. You can eat healthily, but it, can you guarantee that your body cells will not mutate and turn cancerous? Can you guarantee? No, no one. Uh, is biology or scientific possibility going to guarantee that? No, you know, I went to China. The air is basically hazardous. Mm. Uh, what, three, 300 plus PM, what, PMI, what? PSI, you know, whatever, no. And then people, you know, when they cook the vegetables, you, know, you see so oily, and someone say, you know, this is gutter oil, you know, drawn from the sewages, you know, and then they boil, and then they can't cook, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. No. And then, you see people live, they still live there. I mean, but Singaporeans, we are getting cancer, <laughs> even when our air is clean. Um, I don't know, but, and we are eating healthily, organic stuff, you know, we're still getting all this sickness. So what I'm trying to say is, no, of course. Now listen, of course. If you eat healthily by scientific possibility and all, you might live, you might live longer. But who takes charge of yourselves? Who takes charge? Is there anyone that could guarantee? Now you get what I'm trying to say? It is right to eat healthily. But you don't put your hopes and trust in that, but in Him who created your life, who created every of your cells, that enable it to absorb every nutrient. That is 
what God is saying. You are helpless. You know, that's why, you see, people nowadays, they don't understand. Some of you came from Malaysia, okay? Quite a few of you. You study hard, and then you think you study hard, you work hard, guarantee a good future. Who guarantees that? Can you guarantee after you study hard, you work hard, you met a good boss, you secure a good future? What if there are hiccups along the way? Never think of that. But that is a possibility. Largely possible, I can do that. But I've seen so many people didn't make it. Okay, they've tried everything, they've done everything well, you know. Then suddenly, they got an illness or they met with some misfortune, or they get into gambling, or buying shares, very smart people, and then lose everything, you know, that kind of thing. Who is there to guard you, to protect you? But now you are only thinking by this possibility. And, and I tell you, that's why, that's why nowadays you have positive thinking teachings. Why? Because these people, I don't know, you call them guru or what, you know. They are trying to teach you how to think positively. So by thinking positively, people will be motivated to do well. But Jesus said plainly here, there is no guarantee. What he's saying, which of you, by worrying, you can change the certain circumstances or situation or wherever, you know, no way. So that is the truth. You are helpless and powerless. You cannot guarantee. So that's why God says, now, you cannot even do this little thing. So why worry? There are no absolutes in the ways of man. You know what I mean? No absolutes in the ways of man. Now I'm not saying, I say it again, I'm not saying you don't eat healthily, you don't study hard, you don't work hard. In fact, you should. You should study hard, you should work hard, but you should not put your trust and your hopes in that. But put your trust and hopes in God who controls all things. Okay, who guarantee your future, who makes all things possible. He is your salvation, your hope. That's what the Bible talks about. Okay, so you start by knowing this truth first. So once you know this truth, embed it in, then you can start fighting against the culture and the values of the world. Okay, and the moment you say, okay, uh, I want to put my trust in this. Yeah, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make a lot of money. No, stop. This truth that's embedded in you will go against that. It will go against that, okay? It will, it will secure you. It will put you on the right track. Okay? But if you don't have this truth embedded in you, sorry, you will flow with the world. There is no strength of the Holy Spirit that you could enjoy. You will just compromise and all. Next truth, okay? First, you are helpless. And then what is the next truth? And now Jesus said, basically he's saying, now, which of you can do anything change anything by worrying now let me tell you it is God who do all things he is the almighty one almighty one he is the all-powerful all-knowing all-knowing you see God he is the one you see what I'm trying to say he creates the whole universe and everything in it he creates your life and everything in your life your physical looks wherever you know your intellect your emotions your souls everything come from the god almighty the god almighty nothing in this universe exists by itself and nothing generates power by itself you understand what i'm trying to say nothing okay everything comes from him from him so why why when that's why god said that's why god said something here okay not there is nothing that is not created by him meaning there's no circumstances so bad that cannot be changed am i right there's no situation so bad that he cannot do anything about it but what is he trying to say here what he's trying to say here but what i don't like about it is what god say is i don't like when you worry about money because when you worry about it you focus on money you forgot the source of money. Uh, when, you, uh, when you are troubled or you are upset about your looks, say, when you are upset about your looks, you focus on your physical. 
But you don't know who is the source of beauty, who created, who gave Solomon his splendor, who created the lilies that are so beautiful. That's why he's trying to say, you see, God is mighty. He can give anything. Even when you are anxious about your parents' salvation. Now, when you're anxious, meaning you are worried about it, so you focus on it. And once you focus on that problem, you lose sight on who changed their spirit, who will give them the born again life, you know, now. So that's the thing. What God is saying here is something hinders your prayer. Something hinders um, you from experience, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you must focus on Him. He is the source. That's why Jesus said, Who of you can do this by worrying can add a single hour to your life? And who gave Solomon this splendor and every beauty created everything he has been doing this from day one. So why focus on the things and not the Creator? But listen up, guys. I'm going to say something very important. This truth is so easy to understand, but it's so hard to use. Don't you realize? I say it again. This truth is so easy to understand, but so hard to use. And that's why God doesn't appear to be so powerful until you are helpless. You understand what I'm trying to say? God doesn't appear to be so powerful until you are helpless. God doesn't appear to be so rich and abundant until you are really in poverty. You get what I'm trying to say? You know, I didn't realize God is so rich but I didn't realize I am so rich until I ran into a deficit in my bank as many years ago, okay? I didn't realize I'm so rich. I'm actually so rich. But I didn't realize that until I ran into deficit. Why? When I run into deficit, why? When I run into deficit in my bank, I stopped counting my money. <laughs> then I start to open my eyes to see, hey, actually, uh, I live in this flat. My flat is so big, five-room flat. Some of my brothers live in three-room flat. Mira live in three-room, right? Huh? Some of them four-room. But my, big, my room is five-room five room flat, bigger than usual. I have a stadium, I have a swimming pool near my house, and people need to spend so much money buy the condominium, to buy a pathetic pool, you know, whatever. <laughs> now, what I'm trying to say is, you understand what I'm trying to say? I didn't realize I'm so rich because I've been using my strength. I'm not focusing on it. I'm focusing on oh, how much I still have, how much I still got, how much strength I still have, you know, what can I still do? I'm focusing until you are helpless, you totally cannot do anything about it, then you quiet down and then you, re you realize actually everything that God has created for you, around you, when there's no one else to love you anymore, then you quiet down, you cannot put your hopes on man's love and then you start to realize God's love is everything. He is the one who doesn't desert me. You get what I mean? You know wh why I'm saying all these things? I'm, I'm still saying all these things, you know. Uh, now I'm giving you a value remnant. And nowadays, I still hear people or Christians saying, yeah, Singapore, standard of living so high. Uh, live here, cannot uh, migrate to Australia. Why? Because PSLE is so stressed. All levels so stressed. You know? And then our children grow up, housing property, hard finance, you know, that kind of thing. Let me tell you that. These people haven't gone bankrupt yet. That's why they're still thinking like that. The moment they have gone bankrupt, they will know, actually, God has given us everything. You get what I mean? No, no. What, what I'm trying to say is, when you have gone bankrupt, when you're really, really helpless, you cannot put any trust in what you have anymore, then the truth of God stands still right before you. Then you realize, actually, you've been so rich. And people who are saying all these things live in condominiums. I don't know. You see? That's why I bless you people. You don't have too much. You don't have too little. Thank God for that, you know. <laughs> but I'm saying, a fact, wherever God is doing upon us is to turn us to a very simple truth. And He doesn't appear to be so powerful, so abundant, until we are really helpless. And then 
we stay still and ponder upon what he really said. Now, that's the thing. That, that's the paradox. That's a paradox, okay? Um, three, <clears throat> and, and what truth is that? No. And I want to say, God gives the best still, always the best to his children. Everyone say amen to this. Amen? God gives the best to his children, okay? You have to believe this. This is the truth. If you don't believe this is still the truth, the whole scripture speaks about the promise of a father to his children. That's why God said, Oh, you little faith. How, should, how can you doubt your father? Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now listen, God leads his, his children the best way. For them to be dignified on earth and to be glorified in heaven. But God can do it anyway. God can make you like King David. He can give you the throne of David like a king. People of position in this society. But he can also make you a John the Baptist. <laughs> uh, no, you live in the wilderness. <laughs> John the Baptist, you know, he, he's his clothes made of camel skin and he ate wild, locusts and wild honey as he grew up. That kind of thing, you know. Really sad apart from the world. People wouldn't do that, you know. While the Pharisees are enjoying all the fame and money, you know, and riches in the temple, God sent John the Baptist and then live in the wilderness and say, repent, you know. It's a message. But when we read the Bible, he is so dignified, amen? You know what I mean? He is so dignified. He doesn't perform any miracles. By, but by the way he lives, he brings people to repentance. So, listen, God can can uplift you a certain way for you to be glorified. He can also humble you a certain way for you to be glorified. You, you get what I'm trying to say? But it is the best for His children to be dignified on earth and glorified in heaven. So, when you read the Bible, be careful. I, I want, I'm not saying we should all be poor, okay? We are not poor actually, I mean, relatively speaking also. But what I want you is, when you read the Bible, don't be drawn to success stories. Now the New Age movement, you know, they have made the Bible a, a story of success to fulfill the needs and ideals of people. No, don't be drawn to the success story, but drawn to the real value of Christ, the real treasure of having Christ in you. Be drawn to that, okay? Be drawn to that. God always gives the best for His children. How about, say, when discipline comes? Now, you want to ponder about discipline. Now, this is the thing. When you have done something wrong in your lives, you know, you know, you have go against God, you have lived your lives for the world so much, and then something happened, or you've sinned. And God's discipline came. You face the consequences of discipline. But did God take away the best? Yes or no? Yes or no, Mickey? No, right? But during then, when you are disciplined, you feel very lousy um, or you feel the pain the struggle whatever you know you feel very down everything very guilty about yourself about what you have done but remember what you are feeling then doesn't reflect doesn't reflect what God has in store for you he doesn't depart you depart from you or desert you just because of what you are feeling now that feeling is a form of discipline but objectively speaking and truthfully speaking God doesn't take away the best from you and with that discipline he brings you forth to another spiritual level now when when you are disciplined you have to pray with that spirit with that mindset with that truth as I should say okay with that truth so don't don't be drawn into the untruths in your life or in your feelings or your negative circumstances, you know. And last truth, okay? Last truth I'm going to talk about from this scripture that we read. I'm going to give you four truths today, okay? The first, for the first part. Now, the true value for a child of God lies in the kingdom, 
in a kingdom purpose life okay the true value lies in a kingdom purpose life now listen people at the end of our lives we will not be measured by what position we hold in the society or how well we did our ministry or not even how many souls we brought to the Lord will be measured by whether we truly value the kingdom above all else and live a kingdom purpose life okay this is what God is saying here you know why is this so important and why is this so unique because the world has no place for such values you can go to anywhere in this world you can read any books written by the pagans or by the successful people of the world they will never tell you they, will, they can tell you yes you should do good works yes you shouldn't do anything against your conscience they can tell you that but they will never put any value in living for the kingdom everything every philosophy of this world is only focused on what to do and how to live your lives on this world, to be successful to edify yourself nothing about the kingdom nothing the world will tell you okay even as christian okay you do your bit for god okay you do your bit for god but live your own lives pursue your own future or maybe you you do a bit to, to serve god to ease your conscience and try to have a good attitude when you serve God in church. Even the pagans will, will write books and all to tell you that pursue a religion. If you are a Christian, be a good Christian. Even nowadays, Christian, he, nowadays, the humanists, the unbelieving humanists, they will tell you all these doctrines and all. But it will not tell you the whole value of the kingdom. The purpose of your existence, the purpose of everything you are is for the kingdom that's why let me say listen up that's why in first peter i want to point you to this truth this is a heavenly spiritual truth verse chapter 1 verse 10 to 12 if you read you will know what it says peter spoke concerning salvation he spoke concerning the old testament prophets they prophesied about christ who came to suffer and after that after he suffered and died resurrected the Holy Spirit is given to man, the human, okay, to man like us, made of flesh. The Holy Spirit is given us to preach the gospel to the ends of the world. And later on, it ended with saying that the, even the angels long to see these things. The angels are envious of that. The angels are waiting for that. The angels long to see these things. The, the fact that the Holy Spirit can come upon a mere man and that he has a change of heart, change of value, and he only lives for the kingdom of God. That is the greatest miracle. That is the greatest miracle. And that's where God is so marveled, so touched by what happened. Even the angels are so longing to see these things happening. Listen up. God is not touched by, not as touched as a person you know um, okay doing good works or a person uh, uh, performing miracles raising the dead uh, exercising his gifts opening the Red Sea you know speaking in tongues now let me tell you that God is not as marveled okay as when he saw a person be filled with the Holy Spirit and from then on he has a different value in his life and he pursue a different treasure now you understand what i'm trying to say uh, i'm trying to bring to you the true value the true value of the existence of this world that's why the value of the kingdom and the value of the world cannot be together now what you are struggling now with now people why are you not enjoying the power of the holy spirit the wisdom strength and of everything the righteousness of god coming upon you and even when you are with the unbelievers how are you going to impact them why well, you're not experience, experiencing the power and the wisdom of that why because there is no change in the value you know a very little change you haven't got your treasure right you know uh, 
And God is truly marveled by this, the kingdom purpose life, because that's the truth. Listen, I'm giving you four truths here. You get your treasure at the right place. You begin not by self-sacrifice, but by knowing the truth first. You have to know it deep, and you got to confirm it consistently. I say it again, it's not self-sacrificing. Christianity is not self-sacrificing first. You cannot sacrifice anything before you know the truth. You have to start by knowing the truth, know it deeply, confirm it consistently. And now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is, now if you read with me, what did Jesus say here? I'm going to read to you again, okay? Next part of the message. Verse 29. He said, after he had said all this truth, you know, uh, you know um, consider how the lilies grow, you know, why do you worry about this and that? You're totally helpless. God is almighty. Don't you know he gave the best for his children? You know? Oh, you, lo- you have little faith. Whatever, everything he said, okay, over here. And then he said, Verse 29, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink, the physical things. Do not worry about it. Do not focus on it. For the pagans run after all these things, and your father knows you need them. Father knows, and he had prepared them, but seek his kingdom. Now listen, the second part, this is a very important message here. Seek his kingdom. And all these things will be added to you as well. Now, listen up. The word, seek. And before that, Jesus said what? Do not set your hearts on these. These what? These physical things. Okay? Do not set your heart on, on the tangibles. Do not worry about it. Do not put your hopes on it. Why? Because first, you can't do anything about it, okay? You're totally helpless. And second, God has already provided. It's provided. Say, so example, if you need a job, God will lead you to it at the right time, okay? If you need a spouse, God will provide at the right time. Don't keep looking at what others have and develop an unhealthy need. You get what I mean? An unhealthy need is not a real need. An unhealthy need comes from Jealousy, enviousness, and I know it came like that. So you saw how well people is doing, you know, you feel so small, you feel so lousy, you know. No. That is an unhealthy need. Then you want to be successful, you want to do better. Listen, what God is saying here, you don't set your hearts. When you set your hearts on it, meaning your mind is controlled by it, okay? But you have to seek. The key word is seek the kingdom. Oh. Now, I'm going to talk about this. Listen up carefully what I'm saying here. Okay. Why Jesus said, seek the kingdom? I've been pondering about this for quite some time this afternoon. Why not just take the kingdom? Why don't just... Receive the kingdom. No. Why don't why seek the kingdom? <laughs> why? Anyone? John, you want to say why seek? Why must you seek? Seek, seek, seek. Look around. Seek it out. Where is it? Why must you seek? Wherever you seek, where your focus is on. Okay. <laughs> Charlie, you want to try? Why must you seek? If I give you an iPhone, do you seek it? You just take it. Because why? It's so tangible. It's so easily seen and found. But what you have to seek is not easily found. It's not easily discovered. It's not so tangible. It's not so physical. So you have to seek the kingdom. Where is the kingdom? uh? You know, where is the kingdom? Um, Someone came with a testimony of how he prayed and he received, you know, a very good job. He received everything, you know, all that he wants. Hallelujah. Now, you don't have to seek. The kingdom is not so easily found like that, okay? 
The kingdom, listen, the kingdom boils down to two things, okay? If I want to explain it comprehensively, I just boil, boil it down to two things. The kingdom, first, is the truth of God. You cannot talk about the kingdom apart from the truth of God because the kingdom comprises of all the truths that God has determined. Okay? So you want to say, I want to seek the kingdom. You have to have the truth first. Second thing, when you talk about the kingdom, it got to do with, it got to do with evangelism. Preaching the gospel, saving souls, you know, and, and bringing people into the kingdom. So I say it again, okay? It's just these two things. If you talk, talk about the kingdom, the first thing is the truth. The truth of God, the Bible. Nothing deviates from it. The, the world, the universe is created through the truth of God. Everything is in place by the truth of God. Every principle, okay, every living, non-living thing created by the truth of God. You're gonna, it works by the truth. Created by the word of, God, word of God and works by the truth, okay? So, the truth is the kingdom, okay? The kingdom, when you talk about the kingdom, it's truth. So, how, the next thing is evangelism. When you talk about furthering the kingdom, receiving the kingdom, it got to do with evangelism. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, for what? For what? For you to just exercise some gift? No, for you to bring the gospel to the ends of the world. You, you get what I mean? So, two things, the truth and evangelism. These two things, when you talk about the kingdom, it's, it's about these two. So, how to, how to seek the kingdom, meaning how to have the truth, how to have the truth and evangelism as my main concern. You understand what I'm trying to say? Okay, how to have it as my main concern. This is, so I'm going to talk about seeking now. I'm going to talk about seeking. Listen up. So the Bible says, seek. Seeking, I can also say, is prayer. Okay? If I want to put it in another term, it's prayer. Um, true prayer is a form of seeking. You have to uncover something. You have to confirm something again and again. Then you will find it. You have to look at it again and again. Say a 3D picture. You've got to look at it again and again. Then the image will come out. You understand what I'm trying? So I'm going to give you something about this seeking. First, if you say you want to seek the kingdom, seeking is about going deep. Okay? There is depth in seeking. It is spiritual. It is not physical, not superficial, not so easily seen. Okay? It's spiritual. It's deep. It's very deep. Okay? Going deep. Second, seeking is about practicality. Mm, I love to use this word this year, practicality. Now, when you seek for something, you will want to find it. It cannot be abstract. You know, nowadays we have this kind of, this kind of teaching in the church arena. Um, now, I, I take from God. You have a kidney problem. Now, I take from God a kidney. You know, you know some pastor do that. I take from God a kidney. Now, this kidney is for you. Now, take it. And the person say, I receive it oh, in me. Hallelujah. I have been healed of kidney problem. <laughs> so, it's abstract. <laughs> so, I don't know what is this all about. It's imagination or psychological or whatever. You know, that kind of thing. Now, I mean, why are you laughing? It's true, okay? Um, I don't know whether we could know about, which knows about this, but there are this kind of teaching around, okay? It's not, now, let me tell you that seeking is practicality. The gospel is practical. Okay, you cannot, uh, you will not visit prayer again. You will not visit prayer again if you don't receive something practical through prayer. Am I right? If someone says, God loves you, God loves you, Mickey, you know, God loves you, probably the first time you hear this, you will feel so awesomely enlightened. Wow. I really feel God loves me so much. You know, no one says that to me all my life. 
The next time I say, Mickey, God loves you. The third time, Mickey, God loves you. Now you don't feel so convicted or enlightened anymore. In fact, you will feel, God loves me, man. <laughs> why then? Why I got so much problems in my life? Now you will develop that kind of thing, right? Because we, you have to know, if God loves me, how does he love me? I want to know. You see, so the practical thing must be there. How? How does he love me? How did he deliver me? Okay, so the second thing is this. Third, uh, it's about continuity. Continuity. Now, seeking is going back to something, the same truth, over and over again, continuously. Say, so ladies, if you lost your diamond ring, in a pile of sand, you know, oh, dropped it. Don't know where is it, you know. This pile of sand here. <laughs> what you would do is you keep going back to the same pile of sand. <laughs> Sick, where is it, you know. Keep going back. You may not find it the first time. You keep going back, am I right? So when you learn the truth of God, you have to understand what is prayer after that. After you know the truth, you're enlightened. Yeah, this is the truth. If you don't seek, you don't pray, it will not come it will not be embedded right inside you. It will not become the strength of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And I'm trying to talk, tell you something very, very important. But you have to open your ears or spirit to listen. Or some of you thinking about food or, or studies or whatever, you know, or nothing or computer games. You better get your mind here. Okay? <laughs> going deep. Uh, how do you go deep? Answer me. How do you go deep? If you want to go deep, you can only go deep through confirmation. If the Word of God is the truth, <coughs> the only way to go deep into it is by confirming again and again. Listen up. Confirmation. How did Isaac Newton discover the gravity? Is gravity the, the truth? Or not? It's the truth. It's a true thing, real thing, okay? Everything has gravity. Every working in our, in our daily lives has gravity. But how did he discover the truth of gravity? Confirmation. He has to confirm again and again, you know, what kind of materials you put, you know, it will fall down again. How did, who is this fellow? Edison invented the light bulb. By confirmation, he confirmed again, you know, what brings light, you know? He even go to the point of trying his hair. You know, nah, cannot, you know. I heard 700 over times or whatever. That day my daughter told me. 700 times or 7,000 times, I can't remember. So he tried all kinds of material. Confirm again and again. Now, when you first heard the truth, some, for some people, it sounds so foreign to you. It sounds not real because you're very much in the flesh. You're very much, you, have, you can only see God through tangible things outcomes, physical outcomes, results. But then, even when you don't see, it's still the truth. Okay? Even you don't see, it's the truth. Gravity is always there, you know? You may not fall down because you're sitting on a chair. But then, the thing is, you have to confirm again and again why the truth of God says so. Don't be, when you read the Bible, listen up. Don't believe it's the truth before you confirm it. Before you confirm it, you know, you're just telling yourself, you know, it's the truth, make believe, you try to make believe it, you know, but actually, when you face with real trials and obstacles, you will not rely on the truth. You get what I'm trying to say? Before you confirm it, it doesn't become your faith. It doesn't, it doesn't become the truth in your heart. It doesn't become the reality in you. So, without confirmation, your faith is dead. You never go deep. It's always superficial. Superficial, I know. Confirm it, okay? So how to confirm? I give a few examples. You think, confirm it. Think through how many times in your life you were helpless. You cannot do anything about your situation. You can do nothing and all. And then, how God deliver you. You confirm it, okay? When you're really down, when you have broken relationship, no one loves you, you know, and all. If you then, who did God bring around you? Who? Think, you confirm it. You think through all these things. When you are broke, down and out, who provide for you? 
now, now if I if I say all these things now, you will think back. Ah, yes, yes, Pastor, I know, no. That time God's faithfulness, you know. But I tell you, where where did you fail? A lot of times when we confirm, we confirm what man has done for us. We seldom confirm what God has done or when God asks us to confirm, He is trying to tell us to confirm that the truth is really the truth. It holds not only then, but now in your situation, right now. So, for instance, okay, I give an example for my, for my children, okay. Oh. I want them to confirm Daddy really loves them. Really <laughs> loves them. With everything that I have, or I am, I love them. So I buy things for them. Buy toys for them, you know. So every time they receive a toy, they confirm. Oh. But what do I want them to confirm? They confirm what? They confirm what daddy has bought for me. Thank you, daddy. And when they receive this thing, oh, daddy really loved me. He knows what I need, even before I ask him. What, what do I want them to confirm? The former or the later one? The later one, right? What I want them to confirm is my love, my absolute love, my faithfulness, not what daddy has bought for. Because if you only confirm, oh, what did I get? I asked for a job, God give me a job. Thank God, huh? okay, job. Then after that, finish, stress with work again. Then after that, finish, the you know, problem with colleagues again. You get what I mean? All the time, we are confirming the things or the man's help. We are not confirming the truth that God never changed. It's absolute. What he says he will do. One, two, three, four. You see? What I'm saying is this. So, never go deep. So, if my son is going to, or my daughter is going to confirm things like that, after three days, they ask me for a new thing. I don't give them. They forgot everything. I say, why they don't buy for us and all? Because they focus on the thing. You get what I mean? Now, even with confirmation, you must know what to confirm. Whatever God had, has done upon your lives, deliver you, you know, bring you out from your helplessness or your poverty, wherever is, He is trying to embed a truth in you to tell you who I am, what I am to you. Okay. I do all things on the basis of this relationship. So confirmation, okay? Going deep, people, okay? This, this is the first thing I'm going to say. Second, practicality. Now, don't just stop in your doctrine, okay? Stop in doctrine, God is almighty, you know, all-powerful, all-knowing, you know, omnipotent, omniscience, all no. Now, you stop there, but God wants you to seek out. If you say, God is your deliverer, how did He deliver you? How did He show Himself to you? Now, that is the thing. How thing? God wants you to get the answers. When I was weak, I prayed to God. God strengthened me. But God didn't strengthen me. I still feel very weak the next day. But I met someone weaker and I became a comfort to them. You see? That is an answer. When I was poor, I said, God, lift me out from poverty. The money didn't come immediately, but God, through that poverty, made me realize how rich I am. You get what I mean? How rich I am. Like what I said just now. When I became strong, God uses my strength, my strength to fight tough spiritual battle. You get what I mean? So, what God meant by practicality is the answers. When Paul was put in the prison, he prayed. He was still in the prison, but he received answers. That because I am in the prison, the Holy Spirit strengthened the brothers outside to preach the gospel. It's boldly and powerfully. You get what I mean? That is the answers. Now, don't be drawn when, by when I say practicality. Don't be drawn into what the flesh sees as practicality. The, the flesh that sees as practicality is really the physical thing, okay? You don't have this. It's, the flesh is always 
always wanting to acquire things, acquire. Because I don't have this, I want this. I don't have that, I want that. You see? But what God meant by practicality is when you seek His kingdom, when you seek God in His truth, He will show you the answers. He will show you the answers and you receive answers during your prayer. Now, practicality. If you don't receive this kind of practicality, you don't experience this kind of practicality, you will not visit prayers again in joy and willingness. Okay? Listen up. And then the next one, continuity. I'm ending soon. Okay? You cannot do it once because why? This world and Satan will keep his efforts in deceiving you. So you have to seek continually. Keep seeking. Um, for instance, after I say, after I fought a beautiful battle in China, okay, when I came back, I got to keep seeking. I cannot live in my success or dwell, neither can I dwell in my failures. Okay? Whatever I didn't do enough or didn't do well, I cannot dwell in that. When I come back to my home, I have a wife, I have a daughter and uh, uh, children to love them, you know, to bless them. And when I come to Singapore, and you know, love church brethren, you know, I have to prepare myself to be in sync with your spirit, to bless you, to know where your timetable is, you see? So there is so many different circumstances, situations that you have to do it continually. Now, if you're going to just dwell in how well you have done or how bad you have done, you never move forward. There is so many things that you need to seek continually in your lives and and when you say God provides you have to seek his providence when you say you seek God you seek the provider sometimes I seek God the provider sometimes he gives Sometimes I receive sometimes I give sometimes I give even when I'm poor a test of faith you see this is continuity different situation God puts you in every situation and you have to seek Him continually. That's what Paul says, I have learned the secret to be contented in all things. Continuity. Don't stay in your comfort zone, people. Don't stay in your comfort zone. Now, this is the workings no, the workings of your soul. Okay? Through the Holy Spirit. Listen. This is the workings of your soul through the Holy Spirit. Um, after you have done that in your prayer, you will sense the completeness in you that He has transformed you again and bring you to another spiritual level. Okay. Then, I finish with this. Just one point. Then, you will put your treasure at the right place willingly and naturally what is your treasure people okay let me done let me finish with this where's your treasure just now i've said okay where's your treasure guys is it money is it friendship relationship or is it your future for me i share my testimony okay i love my three children I love them all my life. That's why, because I love them. Now, listen, because I love them, that's why I raise them up for the kingdom, okay, for the gospel. And when I have done that, I felt so secure about them. It's not loving them, loving them, and making them my idol. And I'm not denying I love them. Yes, I love them. Fatherly love. The fatherly love that I, when I'm still in flesh, the fatherly love, but because I love them so much, yet I know the truth. And the truth has embedded in my spirit. And be, because of that, my love for them will enable me, enable me now to teach them, raise them, nurture them just for the kingdom. And I feel so contented, secure about them. You, you get what I'm trying to say? I'll give you an example. Is money important to you? Is money important? Yes. If you ask Pastor Vincent, is money important to me? Yes. And because money is important to me, that because of this importance, we all know there is value in it. Because of this importance that when I give my money to the Lord, 
to help my brethren and all. I feel the contentment, the joy is complete in me. That I have offered my Isaac. I'm not offering my Ishmael. You got what I'm trying to say? I've offered my Isaac. I don't know how to bring this across to you. It's the sense of earthly importance. The sense of earthly, my children, money, my relationship. There's a sense of earthly importance ripping for me a heavenly treasure. You can't try and say? You can't try and say? A sense of earthly importance ripping for me a heavenly treasure. It's, it's no longer, now listen up. I'm going to just talk about this difference. It's no longer, okay. Usually we, we approach our Christian life like that. Oh, yeah. Because the word says, do not worry about what you eat or drink, do not worry about money and all. Also, money is so important. So, but the word says that. So, I struggle to not to love money uh, or to use money for God. I struggle. No. The, the gospel is not like that. The gospel is a transcending, it's a transcending submission. It's not a struggle. Once you have known the gospel, and you have prayed and seek the kingdom and the gospel embedded in you. From then on, okay, you don't become an alien. <laughs> or people, you don't become someone who says, okay, uh, money is no longer important to me, my children is no longer No. You are still that you, someone who still have your earthly needs, your earthly longings, you still have, you still have, I still have, love my children, I still love my wife, I, I still need money, you, you get what I mean? But now, but now because of this importance in comparison to this infinite kingdom and I realized to use this that I think that is important for the kingdom I feel so complete in Christ you, you get what I mean? I have finished my race when I've done that so it is not a legalistic submission what the Bible says is not a legalistic submission. It's a joyous submission. It is a powerful submission that you submit in joy. You submit by the Holy Spirit and your joy is complete. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, the word that you've given us and today... I pray that what your servant has not been able to bring across through human lips, that your Holy Spirit will work in the hearts of our remnants to make them understood the power of the gospel that is so compelling in us that have no choice but to spur us on for the kingdom. Father, I thank you for all of us here. And I know it's an uphill task to bring us every week to another spiritual level but i trust that you will do it far beyond what we could or what we imagine so lord i ask for your holy spirit to work in our hearts and mind and and whatever you have spoken through lord you bring it to fulfillment uh, in our fields and such that we could confirm it we could confirm the truth to be true and it stays wherever our circumstances is. Thank you so much. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay.